Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to go through Osho dynamic meditation. And I'm not going to be focusing on all the regular instructions. We'll mention everything. But particularly, we want to look at the areas that are quite complicated, quite difficult, or easy to misunderstand, or don't get presented very well, so that you really benefit from this meditation. So when you hear the instructions, let's say you hear the instructions which begin with, this is a meditation in which you have to be continuously conscious, alert, and aware in all the three stages. And then you hear something about the breathing, which is quite complicated and not like any breathing that people regularly uh, do at all. Then you hear there's 10 minutes of going completely crazy, which definitely gets your attention. And then there's 10 minutes of jumping up and down on the flats of your feet with your hands in the air. Again, a pretty unusual maneuver. And then there's a freeze. And then there's 15 minutes of just standing frozen. And then there's 15 minutes of dance and celebration. And when you hear all that, one thing is pretty likely is whatever that conscious alert and aware business was right at the beginning has long gone out of the window. So I just want you to listen to Osho explaining that particular part. So this first meditation is a meditation in which you have to be continuously alert, conscious, aware. Whatsoever you do, the first step breathing, the second step catharsis, the third step the mantra, ma mantra, hu, but remain a witness, don't get lost. It is easy to get lost. While you are breathing, you can forget. You can become so much one with breathing that you can forget the witness. But then you miss the point. Breathe as fast, as deep as possible. Bring your total energy to it. But still remain a witness. Observe it, what is happening. As if you are just an spectator. As if the whole thing is happening to somebody else. As if the whole thing is happening in the body and the consciousness is just centered and looking. This witnessing has to be carried in all the three steps. And when everything stops and in the fourth step you have become completely inactive, frozen, then this alertness will come to its peak. So the key phrase there is, but then you miss the point. So this is like the basis of this whole meditation. The second, the second difficulty often is the breathing. Now, the breathing can be regular, or the breathing could be regularly irregular, or it could be irregularly irregular, which is exactly what's required for this first 10 minutes. Absolutely irregularly irregular without any rhythm or pattern at all. And that is absolutely crucial. And we'll explain the details of that in a minute. Now let's just say it's tomorrow morning, it's six o'clock, and there you are, it's a little early, it's dark, you're a bit woozy, and you're waiting there, and then the music starts, and you go, right, off you go, breathing away, breathing away, and then suddenly you remember, geez, what did that guy say? Oh, uh, oh, irregularly irregular, right, okay. And then you start remembering and you breathe irregularly irregularly, which you manage to keep up for 
a full 10 seconds before you fall back into a coma and now you're breathing totally regularly again like a steam engine. That's quite tricky. Now, when you ask yourself, how on earth am I going to be able to breathe irregularly, irregularly for 10 whole minutes? Only one possible way, and that's to be conscious, alert, and aware. Both of these issues absolutely fit together. You can't have one without the other. And Osho explains about these active meditations that they're like changing gear in a car. You know, you go to the max in the first gear, and then the second gear, and then the third gear. Each stage or stages depends on the stage or stages that went before. So everything depends on this first 10 minutes. And you can see when it says irregularly, irregularly, the word everybody hears is chaotic. Now, chaotic doesn't translate in many languages exactly as irregularly, irregularly, and you can stand in front of the mirror and you can breathe irregularly, irregularly, and it may not look very chaotic at all. And conversely, you can stand in front of the mirror and give a very chaotic performance and actually you're breathing regularly. So if you're breathing irregularly, irregularly, that means the breathing is as chaotic as possible. So the rest of the chaos comes from the natural body movements. Use your body to generate the maximum amount of chaos. That's what the irregularly irregular breathing is intended to do. So let's look at what this is all about. What, why is this important? What's, what's going on? So, you may have noticed that when you get into a state, you get angry, you get upset, you get miserable, you get delighted, you get excited, whatever it is, you may have noticed that your breathing takes on a particular pattern for you for that particular state. And that is an indication of the extent to which the mind and the breathing are habitually locked together, essentially because of our conditioning. Locked together. So, if we take the mind, sort of figuratively like that, then everyone seems to agree that about 10% of the mind is the so-called conscious mind and 90% is unconscious. And you can think of the conscious mind as being filled with all the things your mom and dad hoped that the neighbors thought was true about you. All the things that you're proud of and you're happy about and you want everyone to think is true about you and all those wonderful things about you, that gets left in the conscious mind. But what about all the other stuff? the naughty stuff, the bad stuff, the stuff you're ashamed about, the stuff you definitely don't want the neighbors to find out about, all that kind of stuff you're guilty about, all the stuff you've forgotten, neglected, ignored, all that gets put in the unconscious. So, there's a barrier between the conscious and the unconscious which makes the unconscious unconscious, invisible unless we discover how to go there and find out what's there. Normally, it's, there's a wall between the two, like a Berlin Wall, which is very compassionate because when someone says, and how are you today, and you kind of go, oh, I'm fine, thanks, kind of. It's sort of genuine because actually we haven't a clue what's in the unconscious. If we really knew what was in the unconscious and someone says, how are you today, the answer would be very different. Now, what's really interesting about this is the unconscious actually gets a very bad rap. When you think of it, the unconscious takes care of your breathing, your heart rate, your digestion, your immunity, you know, some pretty important issues almost like the best friend you ever had. And the reason the unconscious gets a bad rap is because it's in the left luggage business. 
Because the conscious mind, whenever it comes across something it really doesn't want to deal with and doesn't want to look at and is embarrassed about and ashamed about, dumps it in to the unconscious. But what is really important to understand is the unconscious has no interest in keeping all this stuff down here. Also, you can look at the unconscious, it's like a, a really bright 12-year-old kid whose only job is to take care of you and all your vital functions. And the unconscious has no context. It doesn't know the world it's in. All it knows is whatever it gets from the conscious mind. So, here's the unconscious going, geez, what the hell is this doing here? Right in the middle of the corridor, blocking all the flow? Well, I, I guess she knows what she's doing, and my job is just to take care of it. But what's really critical is this unconscious mind has no interest in keeping this here at all. This unconscious mind would love to get rid of it. And the reason it stays down there is because of the energy of this guy in the conscious mind, who definitely doesn't want any of that stuff coming to the surface, because I like to pretend to everyone that I'm completely normal and a nice, happy chap, right? And I don't want any of that stuff coming to the surface, so I exert a lot of effort my whole life trying to make sure that none of that nasty stuff comes to the light of day. Huge effort, effort, effort. A pretense, pretending that we're normal and everything's fine, thank you. So, given the extent that the mind and the breathing are so habitually tied together, if we could cause enough chaos in the body and the breathing, what happens is this guy completely loses the plot. So this guy who's been busy all the time pretending how normal you are, actually then is no longer able to keep up the job, completely loses it, doesn't know if it's Monday or Friday, can no longer guard the Berlin Wall, at which point whatever's in the unconscious can now simply come to the surface. Just as the unconscious would love to see it all go, he's happy that it's all disappearing, he doesn't want it there, this guy is no longer able to hold it down, so naturally whatever's there can now come to the surface. That's why that first ten minutes is so critical as a doorway to the second ten minutes, the catharsis. If you get that breathing to be as deep and as fast and is as irregularly irregular as you possibly can, using your body movements to support every possible amount of chaos, what you're doing is getting rid of this guy so that whatever's in the unconscious can now happily come to the surface during the second stage. Okay? Clear? Interesting, huh? So now we'll just play a demonstration of the first stage with the basic instructions. The first stage. Ten minutes. Breathing chaotically through the nose. Let breathing be intense, deep, fast, without rhythm, with no pattern, and concentrating always on the exhalation. The body will take care of the inhalation. The breath should move deeply into the lungs. Do this as fast and as hard as you possibly can until you literally become the breathing. Use your natural body movements to help you build up your energy. Feel it building up but don't let go during the first stage. Did anyone notice an apparent contradiction between what Osho is saying and the instructions? 
So the instructions say you breathe as deep as fast, so you literally become one with the breathing. And Osho is saying you can become one with the breathing so much that you can forget the witness. Tricky. So you really have to turn up for this meditation. Right? There are lots of tricky elements to it.